or whatever else. Hi friends, welcome back to the library. I have with me today author Mandy, is it Contos? Contos. Contos. So interesting. Okay. <laughs> Accents are weird. Different <laughs> words, different letters. Yeah. Um, but I am super excited to be talking to you because I've been watching, slightly stalking your Instagram. <laughs> So I'm like, I, I want to, um, I just really want to chat. Um, but first I want to get to know you a little bit better. So tell me a little bit about, um, how you got started writing, how long you've been writing, just kind of your journey. Yeah. Um, I guess we probably should go all the way back to the beginning. So I started writing as a probably 12 year old, um, which makes me very old right now, but, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I actually hated reading and writing until I got to that point and I actually had um, a family member gift me Tomorrow When the War Began by John Marsden, which is a very well-known book. I don't know if it's something that you guys would know, but in Australia it's a very well-known book and um, I started reading it and decided that it was the, the book that got me into any kind of like reading and writing and from there like binged anything I could get my hands on and decided to start writing. Um Faded Fragments actually was a English assignment in high school that I started and um, I kind of started it and then from there branched out and it became the novel that it is but it took 20 years to get there and um, because of this novel I actually then went to uni and studied um, a Bachelor of Arts where I majored in creative writing and women's studies and then I did a Bachelor of Writing and Publishing and I've recently finished a master's in creative writing because I love everything and anything there is to do with writing. So I have been like, give it all to me. And then I finally gotten to, to get to here. And yeah, I finally have my novel that's published and it's the first book of six. So, Oh, yeah. of six. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, I, I had no idea you had your master that is amazing <laughs> there's so i didn't even know it could go okay so obviously i know you can have a master's and a, and a doctorate yeah. but in creative writing i figured at some point you just hit your limit i guess i should have known well this I is the thing is sometimes i'm just like do i want to go back and do a, a phd in creative writing because i can do it but i was just like look I've, I've done a lot do i really want the doctor part at the far, part of my name i secretly do but mm -hmm. it's a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of work. I could not imagine. But that's crazy. How many hours did you roughly have to put in to get into? Too many. Too many. <laughs> I actually did the degree. Um, it's a year and a half degree, but I did it over, I think it was three, oh, maybe six years because I was doing a subject a semester because my brain tried to do two and I was like, uh, uh, not, not with the real world. So like it's, as you get older, I feel like when you come to studying, if you're fresh out of school, you're like, cool, just get it all done. But as I found, as I got older, I was like, I could never do full-time study again. I'd need to do like bits and pieces. And the one subject was enough to be like, it feels like full-time study just because it was so intense. But yeah, I, it took me a little bit of time to get there, but I got there. So in the US, they have you um, do a basics, like you still have to do um, essentially like two extra years of high school, which is like, you know, history and yep. math and all that outside of your actual like focus. Is it the same for uni for you guys? No. So you no. Said, but basically you hit like we have it called year 12, obviously senior year for you guys. You have year 12 and then you um, basically take a, a, a and ex like a couple of exams and that kind of gives you your overall score to get into uni and then um, that score determines like depending on what you want to go into it can be anywhere from like 99 percent to you know 50 percent depending on your score and you kind of get into the uni degree and once you're in there you're that that score doesn't matter and it's completely different when you get to university that's crazy yeah for us it's like um so like obviously the majority of what you want to take is supposed is around your major, what you actually want to study. And then there are like uh, minimum requirements. Like you have to, if, even if you're going to like into creative writing, you would have to do um, a physics of some sort, a health of some sort, a math of some sort. Like it, oh it's an goodness. additional. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. I know when I did it, like literally you just had to make sure you had English um, 
I think there was English was the only kind of thing that you had to have. I dropped any kind of like, oh, there was a science. I did like psychology. Um, but once you kind of got to year 12, you could, as long as you had those, I think those two core things, you could do whatever you wanted. So I actually did like a lot of, a lot of stuff that is not helpful for me now, but like. <laughs> <laughs> It's fine. Yeah, one it's thing fine. my um, my parents ingrained in me was the one thing that someone can never truly take away from you, even if like you're traveling and you lose your credentials from country to country, um, you still have that education. Like you still went through the classes, you still learned everything. Um, so for me, going into college, that was really important for me. I was like, I'm going to take whatever it is that interests me, regardless of wherever I end up. And I ended up not needing it at all. Um, <laughs> because outside of having a creative podcast, I am a service rep. So oh, wow. I'm in customer service. So it was like, I didn't really need it because I had that experience from when I started working at 16. But yeah. Did you do you want to do something more with your like with creativity and stuff like that, or is it like you prefer to be on the other side? I kind of prefer to be on the other side because while this is fun, um, I could see that even though like like with writing, it it would be a labor of love sort of situation, but at some point, I would probably burn myself out yeah. because I am one of those like if I am really in it, I'm gonna like full force hard and heavy and i have done that with quite a few of my social medias a couple times and it, it did not work out well for me Aww. i was burnt out very quickly and i was just like okay maybe not <laughs> yeah it does it is quite hard to kind of keep that creativity going and i think i struggled a lot to get to this point to actually publish my novel which is probably why it took so long because I was like I'm gonna go study and then I went gung-ho with the study and not enough time with doing all of the um the prep work for it mm -hmm. so tell me about um your journey into publishing how how did that work for you and trying to make sure that you have it that available yeah, so I um, originally I wanted to go traditionally published. I actually self-published um, this novel just because at the end of the day uh, I like the idea of pitching but I struggle to put everything that I know into a small little document to then be like, hey, please like buy my book because, you know, all of this. So um, my degree that I did as well, um, they actually heavily focused on publishing and kind of doing the indie route as well which was quite unique which is probably one of the reasons why I chose to do the degree um, so they kind of gave us all of the tools and the knowledge to basically publish things ourselves so that we didn't need to rely so heavily on publishers um, I guess the downside of that is that it's all quite a little bit expensive a little bit kind of mm -hmm. more time inclusive because you've got to be the one to make the decisions of you know the, like who you're going to go for a cover artist and how you're going to market it and all of the typesetting and the editing and the proof edits and stuff like that so it's quite a tedious kind of journey but I really enjoyed it and I think that um, I found that I thought that you know doing a draft was the hardest part but I actually dislike all of the editing I wish that it would just be like bam magic and it's there <laughs> So I think my poor editor, um, I, at the time I had like when Beta Bragg was actually supposed to come out in 2022, that was my plan. But um, at the time I was getting married, so I was planning a wedding. I was also um, in my day job I, at the time I was um, working on a TV show because um, I was doing lighting design. So I found that that was quite intense as well. So I was like, you know what, I'll try and get this out there, but probably took me a good a good chunk of time to get through the edits that I had done with my editor. So it was probably the developmental edits the most was the most time consuming really. Um, but after that, I don't think I actually needed it as much because the book and the, the world itself, because I've been working with it for so long, um, I was probably at draft seven or eight before it actually got to an editor. So I managed to finesse it quite a bit and, um, but it's just, yeah, once I got there, it was quite tedious to then figure out exactly what I wanted to do with the text and exactly how the cover was going to come about and all of this other little stuff. So it's 
it's been a it's been a good almost 20 year journey to get to where I was so yeah that's quite the journey 20 years yep but the next one definitely won't take that long so <laughs> I, you know, for your, for your reader's sake, I, I'm going to say, please, please I know. Already, I already have a, a couple of my friends are like, have you read, written the second book? And I'm like, a tin, like, just to, to kind of foreshadow I, all of the books that I have, they're all in first draft, like iteration. So I actually literally just have to rewrite them, but it's getting okay. to that point. So yeah. like, I'm now going through and doing the second book and there's a lot of rewriting, but I'm like, oh my God. And they were like, have you finished it yet? I'm like, I've got 20,000 words, guys. I'm I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, what is your goal for the amount of words for, for each one? See, this depends because the draft that I have now of the first one is 120,000. Mm -hmm. faded fragments ended up on 116,000 so um there's significantly more kind of stuff to get through and I'm just like looking through it and I'm like oh, I haven't touched on that and I have to fix that and I'm just like oh so I don't know mm. 120,000 is like the ballpark park marker but it might be more more is always great <laughs> <laughs> we always love more the books are just going to get chunkier now. <laughs> we love a chunky baby. <laughs> we really do. Um, so tell me about your characters. Where do you find your inspiration um, as far as not just your characters, but your character stories, what they go through, their journeys, etc.? Yeah. So I guess um, I should probably start with Lucy, who is the main character of Faded Fragments. And she she sort of came as like a fully formed being where I kind of knew all about her and it was just that matter of stripping back and finding what made her tick, what made her kind of work and why she was so unique. Um, I do find a lot of my own characteristics in her, but there's lots of influences from um, like my friends and whatnot, but she's completely different to anything else. She's quite earthy, quite down to like try new things whereas um, I know a lot of people aren't in that same kind of situation so she's just very much try figure it out and if it fails well shit like <laughs> so she's um yeah she's like oh god um and then when I was redrafting I actually had Nefertiti who I know many from like Egyptian mythology know Nefertiti as the first female pharaoh and she was very kind of there's a lot of mystery about her because her tomb still hasn't been found we don't know a lot about her there's just bits and pieces so um for me it made sense because she is um I don't know this it's so hard because I don't know how much I want to spoil for people <laughs> but like um Nefertiti and Lucy are quite connected and um, in this, it, it, it shows quite frequently as you can kind of go through it. But um, it was sort of fun to be able to write about a female who is quite powerful, but also at the same time quite vulnerable. And she just didn't know how good life could be. And I guess being able to then foreshadow her in I guess the as the times change and have her be in the modern day it was quite challenging because it was hard to try and find that middle ground of her being able to understand the world as it is and then try and forget the world that was. So yeah, like I, I just they're probably the two main ones. And then Lucy has two best friends who is Travis and he's a werewolf. And then I have um Liliana who is a watcher and she actually pertains quite a bit to the story because um, the there's, a, there's essentially a bit of a curse that has come about and Liliana's descendants were part of the reason as to why that curse is here. So, Gotcha. Okay. Lots of layers. <laughs> Lots of layers. Yeah. Um, so you said six books for the series. 
you're working on number two. Technically, all of them have been started, but do you have any other like uh, ideas out there? Like, so obviously this is fantasy. Are you yes. thinking about branching into others? Are you going to stay there? Um, anything wild in your brain? <laughs> I'm a big fantasy girl. Like, I love everything to do with fantasy, and I don't know if it's because I was brought up with a mother who loved to watch like. Buffy and Roswell and then I kind of got quite into it so I like love a lot of that mystery and that kind of suspense of having something different be in the modern world but I do have a couple of stories kind of floating about that I've started that is a little bit dystopian a little bit kind of they still have hints of um, like fantasy but they're a little bit more kind of sci-fi which is I'm not a big sci-fi person but like it's interesting because it's if I can get through all of these books, that book is kind of sitting there and it's like I've written a good chunk of it and I'm like, oh, I need to actually dive into that. But that's for a later thing. That's for later. <laughs> I know I have um, – I like to watch th- – I like to watch my threads because I have a lot of authors that I follow in there. And um, Santana Knox is one of my favorite because mm-hmm. her threads is really unhinged and she just like randomly will pop in and be like, am I supposed to be working on this current book that has pre-orders up? Yes. Am I currently working on it? No. no. And I'm like <laughs> – I love her brain and I love that some authors are like, I really cannot do that. And others are just like, the characters do what they want. Oh my God. So like I've purposely tried to make myself be a little bit more kind of focused and I've I've messaged uh, my editor and I was like, so do you have time in June to edit the second book? She's like, yep, we can do that. And I was like, oh shit, now it means I actually have to finish it before June. But like my brain is just like I'll have a character because um, in the first book um, Hunter is also another character that kind of goes through it. And so in this second book it's um, about Lucy's brother and Hunter tends to be. But Hunter is like my favourite character out of everything. And so I have his book done. So sometimes I'm just like, wait, I need to go and f- find out this thing about Hunter. So I go back to it and I'm like, why am I not rewriting this book? And I'm like, that's the last book in the series. I'm like, what are you doing? And I'm like, go back to the other one. So it's quite challenging to keep myself focused to be able to like make sure that I stay on the same book. So it's just if I don't open anything else, I'm good. But if I start being like I need to go find something, that's it. It's all over for me. So um, are you like a um, – your characters do what they want when you're writing? Like you let – like you have an outline and then it kind of goes off or do you typically like stay in I your give little them, outline? I give them a lot of freedom. So like I, the way that I kind of um, like to get down the stories, I have a bunch of sticky notes and a pen and I literally write down every kind of thing that could happen. And if it works its way into the story, great. If it doesn't, uh, that gets moved on to another thing. But a lot of the time I'll have like the skeleton of a story and the characters and then I won't quite know what's going on and then eventually it pops up as I'm writing and I'm like, huh, that makes sense. And it happened with the third book which um, I was writing and I have so many different influences, so it kind of tend, like it tends to pepper through all of the books. So, the the third book, um, I you know thought about dabbling and trying to write the second and third together to do like a rapid release, but it just doesn't work. But I'd like to do it. But the, the main character from that, um, they I did not know what they were or anything like that, and then I found out about a quarter of the way through. And I was like, well, shit, that is why I found this so difficult. And now I'm just like, now there's a whole other thing I need to kind of find out about to be able to get it going. So (laughs) they have a mind of their own and I let them do that. (laughs) Just run free, my pretties. (laughs) But come back when I need you. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. (laughs) It's really not too far. (laughs) I love that. So um, do you read at the same time you're writing? I, it's really challenging. Like I'd love to be able to read and I actually um, sometimes, it's a yes and no question. <laughs> Just because I, I find that if I start reading 
particularly if it's an author that I've read quite a bit of, my writing then kind kind of sounds a bit like them and I don't like Mm -hmm. that because, like, it's quite easy to slip into the voice of other authors or at least I've found that it is. So I try to not read as much but at the same time when I get stuck I'm like, okay, cool, maybe I will just read a little bit of this and it'll get me into it. And at the same time, TikTok is horrendous because my TBR keeps keeps growing. And I literally yesterday I saw something. Um, oh, I picked, I, I just bought He Found Me by jo- Joy Mullet. And literally I just saw there was a thing that popped up where it's like, um, what was it? It was I made a, you know, a pact when I was 16 and I got a um, invitation to my own wedding and a plane ticket. And I was like, take my money. Cause I was like, this is great. And then it's like, and apparently he's a mafia like king. And I'm like, yep, done. I need this. So now I'm just like reading it and I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? So <laughs> that sounds like me. Anything <laughs> like t- TikTok is like doom scrolling late at night, which for me late at night is like 9 30 PM. It's really not that late. I, I, my, um, my, my husband and some of my friends are like, you're an old lady. Like you go to bed. It's like nothing wrong with going to bed early. I wish I could do it, but my brain, like I go lie on my couch and my husband's like, you're going to fall asleep. I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to read. I'm out like a light. But yeah, yeah. So like I'm scrolling at like nine o'clock at night. Everybody else is like, oh, you know, it's the middle of the day for them because they stay up until midnight, two or three and TikTok just goes a little crazy. That early. I have woken up from a dead sleep at 3 a.m. and started scrolling TikTok and I'm just like, what is happening? The algorithm just like it's weird i've i've found recently that a lot of like people that i've followed have like dropped off and then all of a sudden they're back and i was like where did they go what happened like what i'm like maybe i've been scrolling too long that they've just popped back mm-hmm. and then at night time they put in their little ads and it's like you've been scrolling for a while maybe you need a break and i'm like don't call me no, out i don't that. how dare you no, I don't <laughs> They're like, maybe you should take some. Maybe you should take a nap or get some food. Or and I'm like, don't tell me how, how to do live you know my, my life. needs. <laughs> how do you know my needs before I do? My body <laughs> communicates to me. I may be ignoring its signals, but it's still, it's communicating. I know what it is. Absolutely. <laughs> That's crazy. So we're not um, reading, but what when you do read what is your like go-to genre that you like to pick up is it fantasy as well or do you read well, i kind of I, I do stick quite a bit to fantasy but um i do like a little bit of crime fiction so um i'm a big fan of jd robb love everything she brings out about the um she has like an in-depth series and there's like 50 books in there and it's it's the dream yeah that's it's so dreamy it's like set in 20 I think it's like 2050 or something like that so it's like futuristic crime it's so cool um i do also really like um she what she came up and i kind of got a bit, a bit sad but laurel k hamilton there was a little bit of a thing where she just was a little bit not as educated about indie writers because obviously times have changed since when she kind of started and whatnot um but yeah a lot of the authors that i kind of quite like have started to be quite problematic so i'm just like I, I want to read you, but I can't. And I'm like, oh, it's so upsetting. But it does tend to kind of be on that. I have started to read almost straight fantasy, which is, I mean, bromance, which is new because I always need a little bit of like that urbanish touch to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've, yeah, I've picked up, I've, I read um, Don't Kiss a Bride by Carrie and Cole, which kept popping up on my TikTok and it's a marriage of convenience. And okay. I kept being like, I'm, I was like, no, that's fine. And I saw it and I'm like, all right, I'll buy it. And I actually really enjoyed it. And the hardest thing I have as a writer is that switching that writer brain off and being a reader Mm -hmm. versus being a writer. And I like look at it and I'm like, this writing is, is quite challenging to read, but I'm like, you know what? Switch off that brain and come Mm -hmm. back and just look at it as like a reader. And I'm like, okay, cool. It's a bit like, it's enjoyable when I can do that, but I find it hard to switch off and do that. 
Yeah. I I could I know that I have spoken with some authors and they've said, you know, whenever they're reading, they typically will think about how they would have written. I'm like, I never think of it that way because I'm primarily a reader, but yeah. I know that there are I feel like reading and writing really go in hand hand in hand. Um, and so there are a couple of different story ideas that I've had before. And I'm like, eh, I don't know how that would work. That would yeah. be really neat. Yeah. We're just going to write down a couple ideas and we'll come back to it in maybe a couple of years. Yeah. I had like, I think the hardest part with, a, with all of the study that I've done as well is I look at a book and I'm just like, okay, this could be tightened or if this had been workshop more, this could be something like this instead of just looking at it and being like, you know what, the author has written this book. It is to the best of their ability and being able to get lost in a story is the predominant factor of reading and people read to escape. So I mm -hmm. guess being able to just keep that in mind and be like, okay, it takes a little bit longer to get into a story because it's brand new to you and it's – you know, if you're not immediately into it, keep reading. Sometimes, you know, you get past the first couple of chapters and you're like, okay, cool. The author's laid all of the foundation for what's to come and now you can really dig into it. So it's just learning to be a little bit more gentle with the reading side and being like, okay, cool. Yeah. It's different. Just figure it out and keep going. Absolutely. And I, um, after after I've heard that a couple times, I was like, I need to approach that in the same way that I approach when um, someone like my my it's mainly my husband and I because we don't have any children yet. But um, he and I have had multiple conversations where um, he'll look at something and he'll go, "Well, why don't you try this?" And I'm like, it's the complete opposite of where my brain would have. And I typically, everybody's response is like to come right back at them and be like, oh, why would I do You know, why would I do that? That's not. But for me, I typically have like here recently, I've stopped and been, I have like intentionally stopped myself and been like, what a unique way your brain works to think that that would be a way to conquer this or a way to approach you know, this situation or handle this. And I've started doing that with some of these stories. I'm like, what a unique way that this person's brain works because I would not have gone that route with this story or I would not have phrased this line in that way. And there are a lot of times that um, I've done, I've done some PA work and I've worked as an editor. Um, granted, I just have a college education, so I don't have any actual. Still a good education. Yeah. But a but a good education can get you somewhere when it comes to grammar and spelling, yeah. phonetics and all of those things. And so I just did some some alpha and beta stuff. Um and I was going through looking at them and I told one of the authors, I was like, I really enjoy this scene, but I feel like this could possibly be more um impactful if you tried to phrase it more like Yeah. You know, if you're open to it, if you're not, yeah. that's completely okay. And you can tell me to shut up and go away and I yeah. will. Yeah. But it was one of those, like, if it was for, and I, sometimes they're like, oh, that's a really good idea. And then other times they're like, ah, there's a reason it's phrased that way. It'll come back later. I just haven't gotten there yet. And I'm like, cool. That's fine. I'm just, you know, yeah. part of my, my job is giving feedback. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think that's what I really love about like being able to give like your words to somebody else is that you see it one way and then they've completely looked at it a different way and it's approached it in quite an interesting kind of take because they don't have the same background and the same knowledge as you mm -hmm. but they can bring something else to it, which is why like I found particularly in my degree when we did like workshopping classes where we would write something give it to the to the cohort and they'd be like okay cool well this is where you can make this better and tighten this here and maybe what if you did this instead um and it was very like it's it's very easy to get your back up and be like oh but but you don't know anything about the story but at the same time being like they're coming from a completely different perspective they don't know about your background or anything like that and they're able to give you this kind of um 
insight into what you know a potential reader will be thinking and it's like oh okay well maybe I hadn't thought about that and I can reframe that in this way and stuff so it's really interesting that you know editing and and doing alpha and beta reading and stuff like that is quite a really great way to kind of flesh out and see where somebody else can approach this story and how it can better your the story in a whole sort of yeah. thing yeah it really is i um and i love that um a lot of indie authors are looking to their readers who have been reading or like really really interested in being part of that um to get their alpha and betas because you know if that's the majority of your consumption already like you may be losing a little bit off of that but if they're on their you know that person's not necessarily buying but at that moment but like for me if i were if i'm alpha beta or arc reading um i'm more likely to go back and buy a couple copies later yeah. I'm yeah. more than likely going to buy a regular print and then a special edition. Yeah. And and it's one of those, like, maybe up front, your original, like, you're not profiting off of it. But later on down the road, I'm telling all of my friends, I'm telling all of my family members who read, I'm buying those copies for me. I'm probably buying copies for my friends. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I actually, like, that's actually quite funny. So my, my best friend and I, um, we – connected during uni over the fact that we both had a book in us that we'd been working on for the same amount of time she released her book a year before mine but um it's i'm just going to give it a subtle little plug it's called unwinding the spiral by peter hawker and it is the most amazing like it's ya but it's it's just beautifully written and I remember the first time that I heard about it and I was like, oh, that's a really unique kind of thing. And then she had asked me to edit it. And then from the time that I read it to when I actually, no, I actually didn't even get a chance to beat her because I was just so busy with trying to do my, um, uh, I guess, my um, my wedding and everything like that. But I beated her like um, – she has like a free little book on her website where it's like a prequel to everything and I beaded that and I was like, oh, my God, amazing. And so I actually, as soon as this book was like up, I was scouring. I'm like, where is it? Have you put it up yet? And she's like, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. I bought the first copy off of Amazon. I bought the first copy off of her website and without knowing, like, because she's she just didn't say anything, like I got it and I read it and I had actually, when the book came through onto my Kindle because um, she was having some issues with the paperbacks. I went back and actually, you know, was reading it, but I flicked back to see what the actual, like, you know, dedication was. And she'd actually dedicated it to me, which I did not really, I like, when I saw it, I bawled my eyes out and I was like, excuse me, how have you kept this a secret for the last six months without telling me? And she's like, yeah, I just, I couldn't. And I was like, oh my God. But like, just to be able to see how much that story had grown from when I first saw it, you know, 10 years ago to now gave me goosebumps. And I beaded her, um, it sounds like baited, beat, I don't know, is it baited or beaded? I don't know. I'm going to say baited. Bait. Yeah, baited. That's all. <laughs> it's probably just my accent. Everyone's just like, why are you beating a book? <laughs> <laughs> We're not beating a book. We're not beating a book. We're not, no. <laughs> um, but I, I, I baited that book and to to read it, and it's like it's a second book in the series, and to read it and to be like, holy shit, to see how far she has come with her writing to this second book and knowing everything that I know, it's just so exciting to see how much growth can happen when you give the book out to somebody and was like, okay, cool, if you approach it this way and this way. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's just, oh, oh, I love it. I love it. I just, I am pro writers. I feel like everybody should be, no matter how scared you are, should be sharing some form of your story just so that then you can get it out there. And if there are crickets, that's fine. There will be a couple of people who will be in the background cheering it on and making sure that there's it's actually, you know, getting to people and to, you yeah. know, have people buy multiple copies like I did a couple of book launches and I had a friend who bought the hardcover his wife bought the paperback and then they bought two other copies to put one in their like little um 
no, they bought one to give off as a Kris Kringle and then that one for another friend. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I would not have thought to have given a book to somebody as a Kris Kringle and specifically an indie author. So it's fun to get bits like that and to have people buy a book specifically to put into those cute little street libraries where, you know, people just grab a book and take it, a, another book. So it's that's the whole point of getting it out there. It doesn't matter how big your your actual reach is. It's about the small little ones that I find. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I actually do that pretty often. Um, the local gas station or not, it's a grocery store slash meat market, but they have Sta- yeah. they have uh, pumps yeah they have yeah. gas they have pumps outside uh, yeah. but it's a small market it, it's a very small market and they it's fresh butcher every day wow. um so yeah it's actual That's it's not fun. like yeah yes um so they're in the back actually butchering the meat and they bring it out to you and they'll cut it to the size you want or grind it down or whatever um but they actually keep a bookcase and it I mean, it's a small bookcase. It's not very large, but Um, they keep a bookcase in the store that's made out of like old wooden milk crates. Um, First of all, that was neat to see because you don't see wooden crates like that very much anymore. Um, And then to see that they had fashioned them into, but a lot, um, it's free for people to come in and leave some or take some, much like a free library. Um, and a lot of our local parks for the city have free libraries as well. So whenever I get to a point where something is no longer um, bringing a certain level of joy to me, and uh, something I know is no longer going to be like, I maybe I enjoyed the read, but it wasn't something that I want to keep on my very limited shelf space. I'll take it down there and I'll be like, all right, I'm just going to put this in the shelf or I'm going to put it in the free little library. And I know some of them, some of it is smut. Yeah, We're just yeah. going to be honest. We're just kind of, it's a gift. Um, and a lot of the stuff that ends up in the store, you can tell that it's, um, there's nothing wrong with this, but you can tell that they're older books. They've yeah. been donated by someone who either their kids didn't read or um, they no longer can read. The The books are probably 30 plus years older and I mean, they're well worn. Um, they're murder mysteries. They're in the small mass, the small, small oh, mass. Yeah mass yeah. paperback um so it was it's one of those like i love to go in there and to see um mainly because a lot of the newer stuff that's popular is not in there yeah. um so i get to see what was going on um if there's anything different that catches my eye a lot of it is fade to black romance a lot yeah. of it is murder mystery and I, i'm here for the murder mystery okay the crime and the thriller yeah. Thriller's a little bit harder for me, but yep. um, straight up murder mystery I'm there for. And I love like documentaries as well. Yeah. So it, it feels like a documentary to me. Yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, it's it's such a shame when some people like just belittle other people for doing different things with their books and, and whatnot. And it's just the community should always be something that is so supportive and like you don't like a book okay cool don't berate it just give it to somebody else or put it at somewhere mm-hmm. where someone else may love it because somebody who you know it's, i get a bit upset when i see a lot of like review bombing and stuff as well because it's just like we don't need that that kind of shit but like if you don't like a book that's fine you, you know it happens move on to the next thing you don't need to be like well this was shit blah, 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 and, like, you know, life is is quite different to, you know, 10, 15 years ago when books were only, they weren't always only just traditionally published, but they were very much, like, a, a market where it was the same kind of thing that came out, whereas now, and specifically after COVID and being able to self-publish, everything is on, on the table. Like, there's no right, no wrong, and all of the stuff that's coming out is it's great in one way or another. And if you're lucky enough to be one of those authors that go viral, that's great. Like it takes a lot of work to get there, but it's just, Oh yeah. 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 I'd love to go viral. Like that's my dream. But I was like, you know what? I'm okay with having a few people. Like I, um, 
I've I've done the thing where I've tried to get my books into bookstores and I've managed to get it into one of the bookstores here in Australia, specifically in Melbourne, that um, give indie authors a go. But they're also a very well-known, um, yes, yeah, very good, a, a very well-known um book retail and they've got a lot of stores throughout the the country and I as a young writer and reader used to actually go into the bookstores um, specifically that one there was one in Adelaide that I would always go to where I would go there and I would peruse all of the shelves I'd go back to either the writing section or the fantasy section and just be like I'm going to be there one day and to actually be able to get my book in there and I actually just had somebody um, come across my TikTok that they saw it and they're like I literally just bought your book because of the cover and I was like oh my god really I go where'd you buy it from and they're like I got it from Dimmick so I was like <gasps> I was like you actually bought a book from the bookstore that I've I literally dropped it there like two or three weeks ago and they've bought a book and I was like brilliant I was hoping to maybe sell you know if, if I sold none they would give them all back because it's on consignment but like to be able to sell one I was just like that amazing amazing your cover is beautiful Thank you. So oh, I, I, I'm like I need to figure out if I can get this from Amazon for the U.S. if you it's can't gonna work I know you can get it directly off Ingram I Amazon okay. stresses me out because I try and be like, why is it not on there? Because like, I can see it from my end and then I've actually gone to support and been like, is it actually available there? They're like, yes, because you're in Australia, it says that it's not available. And I was like, okay, as long as it's available, it should be there. But if you do buy it, let me know. Give me your address. I will give you a book plate and you can okay. have it signed. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm like now I need to know if it's actually gonna show up because it's gonna make me upset if it doesn't <laughs> if not you can buy it directly off Ingram mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this cover though it's actually quite funny because um I like commissioned it and they came back and so uh, actually let me get one of the hard covers because I have a hard cover done as well one second Okay. Okay. So I actually had, um, so the columns themselves were not as like detailed as they are here um, because I got the first draft and I was like, oh, I love it. But I was like, oh, I don't know if I love it. It actually had. So like this little wolf, mm -hmm. this little ank, and then like it had like Nefertiti and stuff like that. And that was actually like in this these parts here. Um, and I was like, I can't have that. So they went back and they kind of gave me this. And then the font had to be the hardest thing that we were changing over because it just wasn't right. So I think I went through three or four drafts before I actually got it. And um, I literally had the cover the day of the release. So I was I was working with like a like a prototype of a draft and I was like oh my god it was the most stressful day of my life because I was like it's out today like why do I not have a cover and I was like oh my goodness mm. and got it all and then I had to like go through Ingram and try and get copies because I had a book launch so everything I'd like set up I'd had a book launch that I needed the copies for and I couldn't get the books in time so I had to get like a local printer to do it so it cost quite a bit to do my book launch because I like needed this and then I got quite lucky because um, I got everything finalised and the book people were like, yep, cool, it's done and it actually got delivered the day before the book launch. So I had enough books but the only problem was is that I had on the side here, there's this overlap which is actually there's only like a hundred of these out there but they are the original ones and I actually got it fixed so that there's no, no overlap. overlap I love when that happens though I love when it oh. happens it is so stressful for you guys and it's so anxiety ridden for you guys and I feel bad because I enjoy it but then I can go I have one of so many print it's, yeah I just, it's special to oh. me yeah, I had a friend because I was reading it and because I was so stressed trying to get the final copy done, um, one of them were like, you've got a mistake in your book. And I'm like, no, don't tell me that. And they're like, yeah, it is. And she showed me and it was like a terrible mistake. So the copy with the overlaying cover mm. or spine has the spelling mistakes. This may have a spelling mistake, but I managed to get them all. And 
because I actually have um, the word magic in there, I've put a K after it just to kind of work with a lot of like stuff that goes in the book. And my proof editor was going through and being like, maybe you should take this out. And I'm like, no, no, it's in there. And then somewhere along the lines, the versions got messed up. So there was some with K and some with C. So I had to go back through and find all of those. And I was like, how did I miss that? Because I just, oh. You know what? I I am to the point where I'm like, if I know you went through so many drafts of your book and you had editors and you had alpha readers and beta readers and arc readers and I know you've probably drafted this book so many times. I'm like, it deserves to be in there. Yes. (laughs) It deserves to be in there at this point. We can't stress about it because it's not good for your health. It's not good for your mental health. I just get mortified. (laughs) Everyone's like, I found another mistake. And I'm like, shut up. Like I have a friend who he was like, "Um, and I can't unsee it now and I can't change it, but there's a spelling mistake on the back cover. So (laughs) it has... I don't know if you can see it, um, but it has without the K um, on it magically. And I was like, you know what? I've got through. It's staying. It's staying. I'm, I can't change it. And he's like, you, I'm like, we're just keeping it. It doesn't matter. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I, have, um, I love that. And I feel like there are some people who review um, and leave, you know, they review bomb like we were talking about and they leave comments about spellings and things like that. And I'm like, your review is to give your overall, personally, I feel like it is to give your thoughts about the book and, and the storyline. And, you know, if somebody puts their, their time and effort into something and typically it takes six months to a year or more yeah. Um, to get a well-developed storyline, a book edited through many review processes and actually uploaded and published. I feel like your review should not have anything to say about spelling, grammatical errors, anything like that. Because especially if, um, like in your situation, you switch out a lettering for the sake of the story, or if somebody's creating a whole language you know or a whole religion or something things are going to be spelled funny things you know words are not always going to look the same sentences are going to be structured differently that's just how it is and a lot of people will go in and put those reviews in and i'm like unless it seriously affected your entire ability to read the story it should not be noteworthy at all like yeah. it, it should yeah. not even be the slightest mention at all <laughs> yeah yeah i like i feel like it, reviews should be again yeah purely somebody's opinion but it should also be like okay i didn't like this book because it wasn't something that i was you know quite interested in or it didn't hit the mark that i thought it would but the writers tried like you don't need to put this don't read this because of x y and z and like it's shit because of this like if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it, basically. There we go. <laughs> That's it right there. That's it. That part. Yep. Yeah. Although I do know that um, one of my favorite authors, her name is Lauren Beale. Um, she's been taking her one-star reviews and putting them out there because somebody's one star is a seller. For, and I, there are a lot of the one stars that that go up on her books. And I'm like, yeah, I definitely need to read that one. Like, yeah, yeah. I have, I've a touching wood, but so far I haven't got anything beyond a four star, which is quite nice. But like, I kind of want a one star so I could be like, all right, cool. That's your opinion. I'm like, guys, somebody one star it because of this. And they'll be like, oh, <laughs> but don't go review on me guys, please. <laughs> No, please. Oh my gosh. No, we don't like that. (laughs) What? Okay. So one thing that does really actually bother me is if, for example, like Sarah J. Mass, she has um, obviously a really massive publishing deal and she's got her stuff lined out and they'll upload um, the next book in the series to like Goodreads or Amazon for pre-order and people will go in and put reviews in. And I'm like, there's no possible way. There is no possible way if the release date is like way at the end of 2025 that you have even 
come close to touching there should not review. be yeah there should not be a system where like unless it's specifically open for art creators or if there is no actual manuscript there there shouldn't be a point where you can put a review um i know there's a an australian author Ardy rd baker she keeps getting review bombed quite a bit and it's frustrating because it's somebody or or a cohort of them that just want to get back at her for god knows what like she's quite lovely you know really um supportive and they just want to bring her down and it's got to the point where like you know she has a book that hasn't even been released yet and there's been somebody who's gone through and gone and made the effort to review bomb everything that she's written and there's stuff where there's, it's got uh, it's under like a different pen name and they've found that and they've still managed to do, and i'm like why like you you do nothing but hurt the other person and it's just the fact that somebody is so malicious to be able to do something like that it's just it's unacceptable like do no. you not feel guilty about that like you're just hurting somebody i also and i don't know if you've seen this because i feel like our tiktoks are a little bit different algorithm wives mainly probably because of the country difference but um (laughs) there was someone who admitted in a facebook group that she was an author and she was going in under um a false identity and agreeing to be on other authors arc review teams and writing nasty reviews about their books and Stop it. I no, it broke my heart. Oh, that was like the the cat Karen, was it cat Karen where oh, I got one side. But anyway, so you keep going, and we'll come back to that. <laughs> but yeah, she um, and then somebody went in and like screenshotted the review she did. They took screenshots of her comments because she posted anonymous, anonymously in a group saying that admitting everything and people were screenshotting it and then she went in and like took down the review and took down her post admitting it um but she basically went in anonymously um after she removed all of those admitting um she was like it's not just me that's doing it there are other people who are doing it too because these authors that that don't deserve these reviews they don't reserve deserve all of the rant and rave and yeah it just broke my heart because i was like these people put a lot of time and effort into this and you know this is someone's livelihood yeah that's so horrible like i don't understand people and maybe it makes me naive but i could like if i don't like a book i will just leave a four-star review and kind of just that's it i don't need to say why but like four stars is still pretty good like i don't i just you know it's five stars if i love it and i really really want to rave about it but it's four stars otherwise like you don't need to go through and try and damage someone else's reputation as a result of you not wanting them to succeed like that's not fair yeah and i feel like amazon and goodreads need to get with the program you know three stars is not bad yeah um and even if it is two stars or one stars, just because that like the star rating should not have any w- weight as to what's being pushed. Yeah. Like you should be pushing something based on how often it is being clicked on or how often it is it being bought, mm-hmm. um, you know, or if it's newly released, that kind of thing. Because like I said earlier, you know, somebody else's one star is most likely my five star because yeah. I read a lot of dark dark romance, dark fantasy, fantasy, you know, things that a lot of other people, especially people with triggers, can't or won't read. Yeah. And I am just like, I'm all for it. Give me it. Give me it. <laughs> yeah. Give, give me it all. Triggers and everything. I have none. I just run with the punches. Yeah. If it hurts, it hurts. I will be okay. I feel like <laughs> reading something is less triggering though. Cause I remember like I read, um, Thomas Harris's Red Dragon. I can't watch Silence of the Lambs to save my life. I can't watch any of that gore stuff. I think it's disgusting and I feel like very physically ill. Give it to me in book form and I can read it no problem. I'm like, oh, cool, this guy's flayed alive and, like, you know, his skin's on fire. (laughs) No problem. Show me it. Get it away from me. I cannot see this. Like, I did a crime, um, a crime fiction unit during uni and we had to watch 
we had to read like the talented Mr. Ripley. Um, it was Patricia Highsmith's novel. Um, we did that Red Dragon, and we had and I watched the talented Mr. Ripley. And I remember watching it being like, I can never, like, and it wasn't even that bad, but I remember being like, I can't look at, uh, who was it, Jude Law, the same way again. Or like, and I was just like, no, but like reading it, I'm like, oh, that's fine. It's taken on someone's identity. But the fact that in the movie you physically see them, how they've, I was like, no, no, can't do it. <sighs> the One of the shows that I watch is Criminal Minds. And um, it keeps popping it's... up on my TikTok and now I want to go watch it just for the, uh, the Spencer stuff. <laughs> I was like, I don't even like him, but I'm like, I've seen the evolution. I need to watch it now. It's pretty great, but one of the um, one of the episodes in one of the later seasons, um, it's like season twelve or fourteen, somewhere around there. Like they have quite a few. Yeah. Um, there is a gentleman who actually like carves people's faces off and wears them of course yep wears them <laughs> or like lays them out in places oh god and so of course of course i watch it but i'm like cringing every time i see just like a random and i know that it's it's got to be like a plastic yeah kind of because it's a tv show yeah but i'm like i like still not it just... laying people's faces off really like <laughs> that would be uh I'm laughing, but that would be so bad. I know. <laughs> oh my goodness. Sick minds, sick minds, but yes. <laughs> Could you imagine being an actor or an actress and walking Ooh. in and maybe being... They're like, here's a real person's face. No, thank you. I think I'd quit on the spot. <laughs> I would. I oh. definitely would. But I can tell you right now, I've I've read stuff similar, and I'm just like, okay, yeah, it's fine, like yeah. whatever. It's yeah, cool. You're like that's cool. I can deal with that. But like when you're mm -mm. Mm -mm. it's just like uh, watching shows that you have people stalking. Yeah, I'm like, I can I can watch it. The thought of that happen, like if it happens to you, you're like. Mm -mm. I can I can watch it because I'm like that's weird. But then like a couple of days later, I'll feel like somebody's watching me, and I get like I get like crawlies. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna, like I have the thing where like I go to bed and I've got to make sure that the blinds are down before it's too dark. And I've had this ever since a kid, and I've always lived. My windows have always been against a fence, but like my biggest fear is to see a face outside my window. So I always quickly put the blinds down, and I'm like, nope, I don't care how dark. Just quickly, and then we'll run out of the room because I was like, nah, can't deal. And then I have like a friend who lives in the um, Appal Appalachians, not Appalachians, Appalachia, Appalachia. Uh, I, I don't, so. I don't, yeah, she lives up there. And I like that came across my TikTok and I was like, um, excuse me, you didn't tell me that where you live with this badge. She's like, yeah, I remember going into like the forest near my house and there was like somebody like I was with a friend and they just didn't like this friend. I was like, oh, my God, why do you leave your house? I was like, I would not be. No. Mm -mm. It's terrifying. I get called an old lady right now because I go to bed early and because I don't like nighttime activities. I would really be an old lady if that was happening local to me because I would not be. I would be a shut in. Yep. Like I I'm not leaving my house after it gets dark. <laughs> Nope, it would be delivery all the time. You can send my groceries to me. Yep. I yep. already do well with Amazon. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. But then it's just like, oh, no, somebody knows where I live. This, then there's this brain stop. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like you start <laughs> thinking, I could do it. Then you're like, oh, wait. But then I'm really isolated. And oh, God. <laughs> Sometimes my imagination gets the better of me and I'm like, okay, let's not like, I, we, my husband and I, we travel quite frequently between Adelaide and Melbourne and we left one time and it was quite dark and I thought it'd be good. Let's, let's go and Google, um, serial killers from the, you know, that we have. Yeah, I know. Serial killers like on the like highway. <laughs> and I was like, Oh my God, I go, we're not even anywhere near these things. But, and there's been like some really bad, like, uh, so where I'm from, Adelaide, um, 
that the state is actually known as the capital, the murder capital, essentially. And it's because there was a whole bunch of bottle, bodies found in barrels. And it was this specific, and I was like, growing up, I was like, this is the safest town ever. Like, we're all good. I moved states and I'm like, holy shit, we were like, not that safe, but like, oh. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, first of all, you never Google that at oh, night. So then my husband was driving. I have to make sure all the doors are locked. And I'm sitting there going, I'm just going to sit here. And he's like, what's wrong? I'm like, nothing. Just keep driving. And I'm like looking. And I'm like, is there a person? Is there a person? <laughs> right. I did it to myself. And I, I willingly know this. <laughs> I have so many notes. I'm like... Anyways, <laughs> so like, let's move on. <laughs> oh my goodness. Do it to That's myself. Funny. But you know what? We say that and I'm going to feel like I have the creepies. You're going to message me tomorrow and be like, I slept terribly because I decided to go and Google this. <laughs> Oh, I don't need to know. I don't need to know our crime rate. I this is the United States. It's oh. high. Um, so I, I don't need to know. That's just like um the it's like a nature, almost. Mm. Yeah. 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 Crime rates are, are extremely high. And even if I feel like they're not, I don't live that far from larger cities with Higher. really bad crime rate yeah higher yeah. crime rates so it's just one of those like it, it i would never look at it but something that is um pretty common is the video, video doorbells have like little communities where you can post to them footage of like people's dogs or somebody breaking in so that you can get feedback to see if anybody else's cameras have captured them to turn into the police oh so um i've seen on some of the video doorbells you know videos of that sort of thing and something that is popular is the um registered sex offenders they have a website they have to be on yeah and so if somebody new moves in it goes up on the ring community and it's like protect your you know all yeah. of that I'm like, this is such an invasion of privacy absolutely like, it to, is and like i understand that if you if you do something to put yourself in that situation where you have to be on that list like you've pretty much given up your right because you have to announce yourself you can't live in certain places you can't yeah he was in but yeah. like for someone to actively be watching it, like how paranoid do you really have to be to be actively watching that website so much that you are posting about somebody moving into your area? Yeah, they'd have like a notification where it pops up. They're like, oh, okay. And you're like, no, like. I didn't need to know that. <laughs> I, let me live blissfully ignorant until I need mm -hmm. to, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's just like I am... Um, and we're way off book talk here, That's, but this is just, I love it. This is just part of it now. This is us responding. But um, I have this massive phobia of snakes and spiders. Oh, you would not do well in Australia. I, no, spiders are I not my not. thing. I hate spiders. I don't even, as much as I have a couple friends that are in Australia and New Zealand, no thank you respectfully you will stay if you choose to stay there you will stay there but i will not be visiting it's not that bad if you go to the cities it's not bad it's the uh the country towns that are the issue i'm good it's fine i don't need anything bigger than my pinky fingernail and i freak out um oh god <laughs> you just, yeah you're like no no mm -mm. no no thank you um I just, I cannot, because if it is the size of my head, we will have a problem. We will have a very big problem. I've never seen anything, if it makes you feel better, and I live in the city, I've never seen anything bigger than this. Okay. So, it's not that bad. I just, But I've seen photos of bigger, and I'm like, mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nope. 
So I'm going to stay over here. Um, and Where it's safer. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. I know my enemies. I know my, I know my enemies. You know, I understand we have black widow spiders and mm. I don't work I don't work in in the oil field mm. and I'm hardly ever in the woods so I don't deal with them. You like that? They stay where they and, need to stay. And any sort of snake that would be around here is going to be a garden snake um or like a king snake that eats others and that is my husband's job. But the snake, I run honey, back in the house. you go do the, you go deal with it. I tell him, I'm like, I go to my husband, I'm like, there's a spider. He's like, yeah, and? And I'm like, go and kill it for me. And he's like, nah, and so I have to get the spray. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and then it's just like, oh, you get that like feeling of just like, Ugh. something's crawling. Yep, yep. Oh, yuck, yuck. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> okay, we, we get to back to the books. Back to the books because it's safe, 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 safe. Safe topic. Well, sort of. I started. Um, I got to tell you about this story that I started, and I don't yeah. know if you'll be able to get it, but um, there is a an author who went TikTok viral. Mm -hmm. Her name is Harley Leroux, and it's um, the first book in her trilogy is called Her Soul to Take. I've heard and that. It's like a. I'm only a couple chapters in, but it's yep. like a monster demon mm -hmm. um, sort of witchy vibes Sounds right like now. Sounds like my kind of I thing, am, but I'd read. I'm so into it. I love like, it. I'm, and the cover, the cover looks like a, um, it looks like shoulders down of a more masculine figure yep. that is tattooed out. Oof. Tattooed out. Give me them tattoos. And, I know. <laughs> me too. Uh, uh, Love it. Yeah, ma masculine figure that is um kind of buff, tattooed out, and it's got the um a skull oh, with horns. Yes, I've seen this book. Uh, I've just I've just googled it yes. to make sure. Yeah, I've seen it. Good old Google. Oh. Yeah, that's good. You're it's liking good so it. Far. I like it so far. Excellent. It's very interesting. Excellent. The female main character's best friend described her as a ghost goth girl. Ooh. So I'm kind of like, I really like these vibes. Yeah. I'm really feeling it. And yeah, yeah. the main male character is a demon. So I'm like, I'm here for it. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> I always, I, I, it's really interesting because I read, um, so I read, I don't know if you've heard of her, but Rachel Vincent, she's urban fantasy and does like, um, she's traditionally published. So I found her first novel way long ago. And she's probably one of the authors that I kind of find quite close to, like, I, I love that whole genre so like I find her as one of my very main kind of influences and she has a series like her, her young adult series is um Soul Screamers and it's about a banshee who um yeah it's really cool um who basically like there's seven books and it actually as you go through it each book is a different color that pertains to a um a deadly sin so like it's kind of stuff like that and oh. the first book is my soul to take as well um so it's it's really great i love everything she writes and a lot of the reasons as to like stuff that's in my novels is i've got you know dual narration because she's done your dual narration which was done like so viscerally that i was like oh my god like that's what's missing in my novel so i'm you know added in and stuff like that so it's she's amazing like if you have time to find her books get them I shall. Yeah. I shall. Okay. So to wrap up, I want to ask you, um, so you said you might be going to editing on your second book in June, July, the summertime. Yes. So like when are we hoping to release? So according, did I write it there? Yeah, I did. So it's actually just there, which is a spoiler. <laughs> Which you can't see because I think it's back to front. <laughs> but I'm hoping. Oh, yeah, you're like, hey, can I see? Can I see? I'm hoping October. Okay. But I, I say that very loosely because I'm sure between then and now something could happen. But like, I have, um, 
a couple of book events in November, so I want to have both faded fragments, which is the first one, and the second one's called Fractured Pieces. I want to be able to have both of them available. Um, but it's just making sure that I can put in the work to do it because I'm just – it's, April's are a very challenging month for me. Um, my dad unfortunately passed away 10 years ago in this month, so I'm very much like the next five days are a little bit hinky because it's, it's more of like remembering back when it all happened and stuff. So my I'm, I'm more scattered than what I normally mm -hmm. am, so it's a bit of a struggle to try and get some stuff down, but I'm trying very hard and I'm like if I give myself small little little points I can get there mm -hmm. but it's just a matter of getting there so um yeah. but I've yeah I'm writing at the moment um a very pivotal scene of where the main character Devon is just dropped off to I guess it's like it's like a training camp for assassins so he's he's an assassin he's a he uh kills preternatural beings so like werewolves witches all of that so like he gets called in to do that um so it's the first kind of scene after well kind of midway through the, the whole premise of the of fate of fragments is that lucy goes to egypt to find out what happened to her siblings and realizes that they're not dead um and devon and destiny who are her sister her siblings they kind of crop up and by the end of it you also find out that where they've been and stuff like that so it's not too much of a like you assume like when you're reading it if she's going there to find somebody she's gonna find them so um he is dropped off to this assassin training school um but he's a little bit special and i've kept what he is very very close because like i feel like he's very unique so i'm trying to keep that premise very very close but if people are on my newsletter list and um following my sub stack which i started i've actually dropped it into there so <laughs> okay <laughs> right Save i can give links to less. everything if you need like if you send me what you need i can give you all of the links yes. okay i will get all of those from you thank you for chatting with me thank you um, i will grab those links from you and then i'll be making an edit with the release date so that i can share it with you um, yep. and you can share it if you'd like yep. um so hopefully i'll have this i've got one set up for next week because i'll be out of town yep. um we're looking probably around the first of May. Yeah, cool. Okay. Easy. Yay.